Welcome to the Dadpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Oliveira. Today on the show, we have Tom Bashant. Tom is going to talk to us about his journey as an entrepreneur. Tom has been featured in Forbes 30 Under 30. He's had several startups. Uh, the company that he's a founder in right now is called Every Space. I'm not going to tell you exactly what it's about because Tom is going to tell us. But he's also going to share some funny stories about his journey as an entrepreneur. Has a little something to do with the RV. And I tell my listeners that because as, as my listeners know, we RV, my, my wife and my kids, we love to get out in the RV. And so there's this element of being a digital nomad or a digital entrepreneur that is, is, is in my world. And so I think we, we have that in common, Tom. So welcome to the podcast, Tom. Hey, thanks, Alex. Good to be here. Excited to uh, tell you more about that RV story. Yeah, well, let's go right into it. Tell us. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I was definitely excited to talk about the whole, you know, uh, journey of the different startups that I've been involved in. I know that's part of uh, what you want to get into here. And I think that my start to the game is pretty, pretty unique and kind of shows how the path is not always what you expect it to be. Um, so my first startup company was uh, actually a ride sharing app for college students that I started while I was in college. Uh, this app was, it was called Sobrio. And our whole goal was to provide sober rides for students on the weekends. So, you know, reduce drinking and driving, make it easy to get around campus. And uh, yeah, we launched at my, my old alma mater at UConn. Uh, it was pretty successful there. And when I graduated, we were like, hey, this, this app works. We want to try it at other schools. And uh, our plan was to basically do a big launch at eight different universities over the course of eight weeks. And we thought, what better way to do that than get a gigantic RV slap our logo on the side of it and drive from college campus to college campus uh, doing like guerrilla marketing techniques. Like we were doing barbecues, giving out t-shirts, sunglasses, all that. Um, so that's actually like the first, the first startup that I got involved in. Well, that, um, that's, that, that's a, let me pick on that for a second, Tom, because I think w there was so much that you just said there that, that fits into my world, which is marketing and digital, that I think some startups, for especially first stage entrepreneurs, miss out. You know, they think I, I've got to go out and hire a big digital marketing agency and hire some big CMO um, and hire influencers and all of that. But a lot of what you just talked about was do it in house, do it yourself, old school guerrilla marketing. And those tact tactics still work today, don't they? Yeah, well, you know, as a marketer, you know, it's like you got to know where your customers are. And uh, we knew where our customers are physically, like they were on a college campus. So we knew we had to get to them somehow. Uh, so we would just kind of post up in the college quad, like, uh, again, giving out T-shirts, hosting little events every now and then. And so, you know, what better way to, to get to know your customers than actually see them in real life? I love that. No, that's great. And with, with that company, you had a co-founder, right? Yeah, co-founder um, Nadav. He uh, he's someone I met at at UConn. Uh, we actually launched the idea at a startup weekend at UConn, and uh, yeah, he and I worked together for a long time. So yeah, we we built that company together. What's interesting is like during that whole experience, you know, again, you don't always know how things are going to go. We ended up getting contacted by individual companies who were running like taxi companies, limo companies, and they saw our ride sharing app and they were like, hey, how do we get on board? How do we get onto this platform? And, uh, you know, for us, we were like, well, we don't really do that today, but it does make sense that these old school companies should have the same type of ride sharing technology that we have and that Uber has. And so, you know, after this whole crazy RV experience, uh, we saw the bigger opportunity in being a B2B product. And so we took our whole platform, pivoted to be a ride sharing solution that we sold to individual taxi companies. And that became Dash Ride. Uh, so yeah, Nadav and I, we ran that company for about five years out of New York until we were eventually acquired by Cruise, the uh, autonomous vehicle company. Had, had you at that point, Tom, you and your partner, when you, when you guys made that pivot, had you already sort of, well, not you guys, I would actually back up one. I'm assuming you guys had some investors at that next pivot, right? Yeah, at the pivot, we did. So we tried to raise some money for the first idea. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, again, at the time, we were college students. So we were able to, uh, we won a business plan competition, which gave us the money to buy the RV, essentially. Um, but we had some trouble raising money for that idea from the investors in our network, which at the time was Connecticut, which you don't really think of as the, the hub for tech innovation at the time, though they're definitely doing a great job at uh, reinventing themselves. Um, so yeah, when we pivoted the idea to B2B, uh, it definitely was much more appealing to investors. 
we had a better idea of how to scale up the business. There was a much bigger market to capture. Um, and so, yeah, we were able to raise money for, for Dash Red. At that time, when you made that pivot and you bring in this extra capital to, to scale and go in that direction and stay really focused on this new B2B product, how did you guys decide how you were going to divvy that capital? I, I, I always find it interesting. You know, some, some investors and founders go head to head and the founder is saying, I want to do this. To, uh, I need to bring in engineers. And the, 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 the investor is saying, no, we need to bring in a sales force and do a big marketing campaign. How did you guys decide where you were going to put that capital? Yeah, the plan definitely changes over time um, as the needs change. So, you know, we first get that investment. You look at what are the blockers to hit certain KPIs and certain milestones that you want to hit. So if we want to launch with certain customers that are in our pipeline, like what's the limiting factor? Is that the technology is not ready or do we not have like the sales force to basically get enough accounts on board to meet those quotas? So, you know, early on, it was definitely a lot about the technology. We had some initial pilots that we were trying to build out. And so building out the right engineering team was important at that time. Um, but, you know, once the product was in a more steady state and we had launched with a few customers, then it was basically doubling down on the sales efforts and, you know, building out our sales team, a replicable sales strategy, uh, bringing on some seasoned, you know, SDRs and folks like that. So, yeah, it definitely changed over time, depending on what was the limiting factor for us. Got it. When you go back to your early days, you know, maybe before college and you think of yourself today as an entrepreneur, did you always set out to become an entrepreneur? Uh, I never thought about it in so many words, but I think there were some patterns there for sure. Um, for example, I guess when I was in middle school, I used to make, you know, lunch money by selling t-shirts on an e-commerce store that I put together. You know, when I was in middle school, the the hip brand was Hollister. So definitely dating myself here as a official <laughs> millennial, but uh I thought that, like it took over the whole school. Everyone was wearing those shirts and I was trying to be edgy. So I launched a store called Not Hollister uh, and very creative, obviously. And uh, yeah, it actually took off and did pretty well. And it, we were able to, uh, yeah, cash in on, you know, just the uh, counterculture aspect of it. So a bunch of random things like that. Like definitely it's always been exciting to me to just kind of do your own thing and, and see what works. When you think of yourself today as an entrepreneur, what would you say is like the most important um, skill that you have? I mean, soft skills is very hard to, you know, to to pinpoint because you can go into the natural behaviors that people have. Right. But if we're talking simply skills as an entrepreneur for you, what is the most important one? If you had to give up your seat today as the CEO, what quality would you be looking for in that CEO? Yeah, I know this is going to be super cliche, but I think uh, a growth mindset where you just will learn whatever skill is needed to accomplish the next thing is most important. So, for example, at uh, Dash Ride, you know, we needed to learn how to, <laughs> I basically need to learn how to sell. I never sold a SaaS company or sold a SaaS product before. So just the idea of like understanding what is missing in your own personal skill repertoire and putting in the work to fill it in. Um, before, you know, launching Sobrio, I had to learn how to make apps. I'd never made apps before. And so just kind of figured it out as I went. Um, so yeah, I think it's that, that idea of like looking at what you want to create and saying like, well, I need to do this one thing to get there. And so I'll just learn it. I'll like do whatever I got to do. I'll, you know, watch YouTube videos. I'll read books, whatever it is. Um, but not feeling like discouraged when you realize there's like a skill that you don't have. I love that uh, answer. I mean, really, because above everything else in business, whether it's, you know, finance or HR or sales marketing, whatever department you're in, it, it's you having the ability to continuously grow and evolve, right? And come up with the new, the newest, most innovative ideas is really the only way to beat the competition. So, you know, I think looking for that growth mindset is probably in, in the world of thought leadership, it's not talked about so much because I think there is that whole side of the, the, the business world that is like coaching that either appeals to some people or it doesn't. Some people will say, no, I look for mentors. I would never pay a coach. But I can tell you from my own experience, Tom, I mean, I've had business coaches that have added tremendous value to not only me for me personally, but also my company. And then other times I was able to bring in mentors to add value in a completely different way than I would have if I were working sort of in my own silo with my own team or with my business coach. So 
Totally. Do you, have you um, had any mentors throughout your, your journey? Um, yeah, I've had some, some great mentors for sure. And I also had a business coach for a while, uh, Dash Ride, which was really helpful. And I think one thing, as you said, like they help to point out these things that um, you know you need to work on that you don't see when you're just like stuck in the day to day. You can kind of zoom out and just be like, hey, what if you worked on this one thing that seems to be holding you back a little bit? Um, that's, that's helped uh, hugely. Fantastic. So if we're talking about every space now, let's shift gears here. So we know where you've been with every space. What, what was that moment where you created the idea or you had the vision for what it is today? And then tell us what it's about. Cause I think it's the, the timing of having you on the podcast is so important because in every conversation I have with entrepreneurs, business owners, it's people, people, people. We keep hearing about the, you know, great resignation and how employees want to work just from home. And so how do I cultivate culture? I mean, there's a million challenges and questions. And I feel like every space has part of that solution. So tell us how you came up with the idea and then what it is. Yeah, absolutely. So I've always been passionate about community building and trying to bring pe people together. Um, but really what, you know, kick this off is I was working at Cruise, this, you know, big tech company based out of San Francisco, you know, previously all on site, going to the office every day. Um, and as soon as COVID hit, you could kind of see how the culture of the company evaporates, right? And this wasn't unique to Cruise. This, this was any company that was previously on site and had certain rituals of bringing people together. Those were all gone. And companies just weren't equipped to deal with that. It was so abrupt and, uh, yeah, it's really, really disruptive for employees. And you know, I was running a few teams at the time. I knew that, you know, the morale of my teams was pretty low. And I just looked at myself and I was like, yeah, I also feel really isolated. I feel really disconnected from the mission. And uh, that was common just across the industry. So I looked at what was working within a company like Cruise and a lot of ways that people are still getting together and still have and that kind of like human contact and just like feeling more engaged within the company was through these like employee led communities. So at Cruise, these were things like interest groups, like clubs that you could get involved in, affinity groups, uh, employee resource groups, if you're familiar with that term. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a way that within a large, you know, 2000 person company, you can't know everyone, but you could at least find your people within the company, a smaller group, a more intimate setting. And we, we just found that that was hugely effective at getting people's morale improved, helping them feel a better sense of belonging. And uh, we wanted to double down on that. So the first version of the Every Space platform was really optimized around supporting these groups. So how do we get them together? How do we help them host better events, whether that's through Zoom, uh, eventually in person, or just through other sort of virtual connection tools? Um, how do we get them together? And then how do we make it easier for people who are like putting in the work to bring people together, give them the right tools to understand like, what is the impact of their group? Like, are people really resonating with the content they're putting out there? And like, is this really having an impact on their, their sense of belonging? So I'm thinking about the platform and how it works. And I'm going back to maybe 2000, maybe 14, when 14 or 15, when we started using Slack. And, and of course, Slack is very different than what you do. And I know you guys integrate with them, but I thought that for companies, Slack at the time, when we were so over email, everybody's over email. And then like Slack came around and it was like, oh, great. But in my opinion, this is just my humble opinion. Some of my own employees don't feel the same way about Slack. To me, Slack can be a time sucker, just as much of a time sucker as social media or email. So to me, everything comes back to time and it's great to create a more inclusive atmosphere. But what, what do you guys do at every space to help those employees make sure that they're ma managing their time well, because I could, I could see how that would bring them together. But uh, are there any use cases, Tom, where th maybe they're spending this much time on Slack and this time on uh, workspaces or Google or Facebook? I know Facebook has a, a product for companies as well. And we're always trying to get people off of social media during the working right. hours, unless they're working on marketing or content. But um Lots of time, as you know, is wasted with, with employees on, on their devices. So what do you guys do to help them better manage that time? Are there sort of like sprints that they do? Do they just congregate during certain hours? Is there an app? Yeah, so we, we love Slack. We use Slack here. As you mentioned, we're, we're deeply integrated with Slack. 
And the way we see companies use it is, as you mentioned, it's uh, it's like a chat system. It's it's equivalent to a very large group texting thread, which, as you know, it, it can take up a lot of time. You can fall behind, and then you kind of lose what's going on. The, like messages get just get lost up in the thread. And so for us, it's like within these communities, there's a lot of important things happening. So whether that's events, you know, important announcements or you know any other way that people are just kind of like sharing content between each other uh, we wanted to have one home base for that and that's what lives within their every space community so people can continue to chat on slack and there's going to be you know conversations that take place there and you know honestly it's, it's a lot to keep up with so you could go ahead and ignore that whole slack channel for a while you can always come back to your every space home base and see what content's coming up. So I know what events I should attend. I know there's a networking event coming up later and I don't need to go scroll through, you know, thousands of messages to find it. Got it. No, that makes sense. I could, because it, 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 we, we see new apps that come out for business and sometimes they're just a, an enhanced feature that another app could, could create. And my argument to that, when I hear like in Shark Tank or any other pitch, uh, an investor say, well, that's just a feature. And sometimes that's really what you need is something that is very different and live, lives on its own. Because if you bring people back to that one place where they're spending all their time, like Facebook being one of them, like Facebook groups, um, I've worked with companies that had huge Facebook groups, but then the problem is people are on Facebook and yeah. not spend. And at one point, and I don't know if they're using it anymore, but at, for a while there, they were promoting the groups app, Facebook groups app, yeah, you know? Yeah. But it, but then it still cross pollinates with the stuff that are that is sucking your time, you right. know. Where I I think with with for me what was very clear with what you guys are doing, Tom, with um every space was I think in a time where there are so many there's so much social unrest and things that are happening within different companies. Sometimes they they want to be inclusive and they want to be proactive and address every employee's sort of needs. Right. Um, and, it, and it's tough to do it if you don't have a space to do it. Like you can't just send out a company-wide memo and hope that everybody's like, oh, check, that's good. You're inclusive. Yeah. It's funny that you say that. So now that we've been live with a few customers, we're starting to get some interesting data on what is resonating with people. And, you know, for us, again, rather than just be attacked onto Slack, like we also are sending messages via email to people's calendars, like whatever channel resonates best with them. And it's interesting to see, like, it's different for different employees. Some people will always click on things that are sent to them via Slack, and that's where they prefer to engage. And for other folks, they don't check their Slack, and they only check what's sent to them via email, or they just show up to what's on their calendar. Um, we do see Slack is probably the more common option, but it's interesting to see, like, there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. And so it's helpful for companies to understand, like, what channels are actually reaching people, and how can I tailor that to their preferences? Like, make sure that the, the person who only wants to check Slack is getting the content in Slack mm -hmm. and the person who only checks their emails getting their content in email. Right. Yeah. And I, th I could see how this could be so useful for companies who are, you know, currently the way they communicate their, their social stance and everything that's happening in the world is maybe through a tweet or just a social media post. Right. And then they explain like, what about the employees who are not in social media? They maybe didn't get the, you know, happy black history month, you know, little video that you put together and here you are celebrating them, but there's a better place to do that than social media, where as maybe your customers, not that they don't care, but sometimes it can be more controversial when you're trying to do internal things out in the social world, because really you're doing it more for your team yeah. so that, so that people can feel like they're all, they're all heard in a, in a big way, but not necessarily on social because with the politics and the way things are going, I mean, it's it's just so toxic, right? We we do a bunch of surveys about social media, and that's usually why people leave and spend less time on social media. It's all the the negativity, the hate, the fake news. The I mean, the list goes on and on and on, right? And mm -hmm. so I think for a long time we thought that, um, and we we would go to these conferences and hear from Facebook executives, Google executives. And they were trying to build not what you guys have, but sort of during the work, they figure out how can people spend more time on the on the apps, on their yeah. apps. Right. I mean, both those two companies make up nine of the top 15 apps. But I think people are are kind of fed up with yeah. all this. I, I know I am, you know, for a long time, I used to check in every day. I don't anymore because, you know, it's just 
it's easier when I want to talk about something that's important and it's, it's going to impact my customer base, but mostly my employees. Maybe it's a new product or a new market we're going into. There's got to be a better way than a newsletter or then bringing everybody on a Zoom meeting. And that sounds like every totally. space can fill a lot of those, those voids. Yeah. And we see companies doing a great job of creating content, as you said, to resonate well with employees. So you know, a lot of our customers did a lot of great content for Black History Month for Women's History Month, like they're really doing a great job of going the extra mile for employees, mm -hmm. but where they need help is getting that content out to folks. So if, as you said, all they do is, you know, post a random Slack message, like it's gonna get lost and people are not gonna see it. And we wanna make sure that like that work is recognized and like it gets out to the right people. And then I also noticed that you guys do some really robust reporting for the managers or the executives who wanna really translate the, the data and understand how are the employees using it, right? Yeah, for sure. So a lot of what we do, we do some, you know, uh, explicit data collection. So we might send out an NPS score survey mm -hmm. to help understand like, hey, we hosted these events for Black History Month. Like, did that resonate with employees? And was that helpful? Or, you know, do we need to go back to the drawing board next time around? Um, so that's one piece. And then we also take a bunch of data based on, you know, who's showing up to these Zoom calls, um, like what's your attendance rate, basically? Mm. Um, you know, who's opening your emails, who's clicking on your Slack messages. This this basically tells you that data point I mentioned earlier, which is like what channels are really resonating with people. Um, you know, we can properly anonymize this so it's not calling out individuals, but at least on the whole, like how are we reaching our employees? And then what's their reaction to the content that we have there? Like, were people satisfied with the work that we did for Women's History Month? Or is there, you know, do we have more work to do next time around? Um, so yeah, we want to give them that data, which previously, you know, a lot of companies are just doing like, you know, quarterly or annual, you know, engagement surveys, mm -hmm. which uh, it's just not cutting it for today. Like they need like a faster feedback loop of, uh, of what they're putting out there. With every space, what's the thing that keeps you up at night now as a, you know, second, third time around? I mean, if we go back to your high school days, this is probably your, 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 <laughs> your 10th uh, round as being a, a founder, but, but really, I mean, what, what is, what, what's, what's keeping you up at night now when you're thinking about growing and scaling, what are those biggest challenges? Yeah, for us, you know, we're definitely, we're really following the trend of, of remote work and the importance of that. And as you mentioned, like the impact that that has on employee engagement. And so we're really closely watching what's working for employees. Like, our platform has to, at the end of the day, like truly create value for companies. We have to create that sense of belonging. We have to create that sense of inclusion. And so as, uh, you know, ideas change with employees and as expectations change, like we're, we're constantly needing to stay up to date on that. And so that's a, where we're always looking at is like, how are people thinking about Slack? Like maybe the mentality towards Slack shifts and people stop using that and they prefer to go back to email, for example. Mm -hmm. Like we need to be on top of those behavior changes to make sure that again, at the end of the day, like we're resonating well with employees, which is gonna provide value to the employers. Mm, that makes sense. All right, so I'm gonna shift gears here and we're gonna play a little game, Tom. Ooh, sure. It's, okay. Yeah, it's, it's a game. <laughs> it's called, um, I'm just gonna make it up. We've never played it before. So it's, <laughs> this is very fresh. We don't know if the listeners are gonna like it, but it's um, whose tweet is that? Right. Oh, boy. So All right. Let's go. I do and, spend and, a decent amount of time on Twitter. So I think yeah. I'm well versed here. That's right. And we made sure that um, the one that we pick are tweets of people, you know, definitely, okay. people you know, so we we did our due diligence. Like, who does Tom follow? Right. Wow. And we, we, so it's not Elon Musk. I will tell you that much. Like, forget okay. Elon. I'm not <laughs> doing anything. Easy, it's too easy to know. It's, too, it's too easy. I mean, yeah, he's you know, it's like Joe Rogan. Those guys, you know what they're going to say, the most obscene things. Yeah. So, we're going to go a little lighter here. Okay. So here's the tweet. This one's going back. Uh, actually, this one is nine years old, but wow. you engage, you engaged with it. So, okay, let's see. I'm scared. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a great way to not seem like a legitimate business is to register yourself as a dot info domain name. Who said that? <laughs> nine years ago. Uh, I would have been J July, 2012. Actually, wow. this is a tweet from you, Tom. <laughs> I was going to say, this sounds like a cynical younger Tom would say something like that. Yeah, this is, this is from Tom. I love that. You know, cause I, we, we've got this tweet tunnel thing and I look back at people's <laughs> old tweets yep. and just like I look at my old tweets, sometimes I'm like, I didn't say that. Why would I, 
I, I, and then I go, oh yeah, that, that sounds like me then. Yeah. That um, sounds like an old or younger version of Tom thinking he's being edgy by making. Yeah. But, like but, but it was, and why it resonated with me is because in two, uh, 1999, just as I was getting into college, I really started to buy domains. Like that was oh, yeah. like buying domains. I mean, I was buying and flipping domains. I thought I'm like going to be the internet you know, like billionaire. King of the internet. And, yeah. yeah, it was it was fine. But I held some of those domains. I sold a portfolio of over a thousand domains back in 2011. Oh, wow. Um, and they were good. I mean, they ranged from like 200 bucks to maybe the most was 20 grand. So it wasn't like crazy, right? Mm-hmm. These weren't the best domains. But one of the things that at these domain conferences we would talk about is like, here's the TLDs that you don't buy, right? Like hmm. you, you don't buy dot info, don't buy yeah. dot biz, don't buy dot .cc. biz, yeah. <laughs> you know, like dot cc like nobody goes there man dot us yep. uh, you're sort of like somewhere between dot net and like dot co at the time was not that big either or dot io yeah. but it's just interesting where it's gone and so when you when you said like you're not going to seem like a real business if you're not info i'm like right on tom that's funny i think we probably at the time got approached by a company with a dot info and I was like, I can't take this request seriously. You know? <laughs> Even early on, you knew. All right, I'm going to give you one more. Right. Um, so, well, this is you, obviously, but I love this one. This is also July of 2012. You said DJing for a block party at Harbor Beach and no one knows that I'm using Pandora. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, wow. That's funny. So I still DJ that block party. It's an annual tradition with uh, my family. It's uh, like the neighborhood where they grew up. It's a, a small little beach neighborhood in Massachusetts. Nice. And, you uh, use Spotify now? What do you use? Oh, now it's Spotify for sure. Um, they chose yeah. me as the DJ exclusively because I had a PA set up and I had speakers loud enough to actually like play the music, not because I had DJ skills. And, They're like, what, uh, what a genius. You're just playing some other DJ. <laughs> I remember I put on the Pandora playlist. I had several people come up and be like, Tom, what an amazing music choice. Like, this is incredible. And I was like, oh, thank you. Very talented. Yeah, you missed your calling. Well, no. <laughs> so listen, we had fun, Tom. Thanks for sharing your story with us. And um, any, any parting thoughts here? Um, no, I mean, definitely. Thanks for having me on board. Uh, I know you talk about this a lot, but just that idea that uh, um, your entrepreneurial path can be totally unexpected and follow wherever it's leading you. I think that, you know, that's uh, been my story so far. So it's been a lot of fun and uh, yeah, definitely appreciate the time. Thank you so much, Tom. 